Good evening and welcome to the Historic Lawrence Collection. My name is Matt Farah. I'm the curator of traveling exhibitions here. I want to thank you all for sharing your evening with us. Uh, I think this panel is going to be very enlightening, so we're glad that you're all here. Um, before I introduce tonight's speakers, allow me to give you a little calendar of what's going on here at the collection. I'm sure you all noticed the empty hallway on your way in. We will be installing Seeking Life photographs of Lucario Hearn's Japan, which will open October 10th and will be on view um, through November. It will be here for Photo NOLA, so come by and see that. In addition to that, Enigmatic Stream, the industrial landscapes of the lower Mississippi River, will be open in the Scovern Gallery of the Tricentennial Building of the new Brulator installation starting September 17th. Art of the City, which is there now, will still be open on the second and third floors. And that is open till October 6th. In conjunction with that exhibition, we have a book club on August 28th, featuring the book Vengeance, a novel. The author, Zachary Lazar, will be there along with photographer Deborah Luster. Now to the main event. As a quick programmatic note, we're going to let the panelists discuss their respective topics, and then we're going to do a full Q&A at the end, so hold your questions till the very end. You might find that your question gets answered over the course of the evening. Um, and now I'd like to introduce the moderator for tonight's event. David Robinson Morris is the founding director of the Center of Equity, Justice, and the Human Spirit at the Xavier University of Louisiana, assistant professor in the Division of Education and Counseling and serves as the university's director of corporate and foundation relations. David obtained his Bachelor of Arts in Communications Public Relations from Loyola University in New Orleans in 2006, Masters of Public Administration from the University of New Orleans in 2011. He holds a PhD in Educational Leadership and Research with a dual concentration in Higher Education Administration and Curriculum Theory and an Education Specialist Certificate in Educational Leadership with a focus on applied research, measurement, and evaluation, both from Louisiana State University. His primary area of research utilizes non-Western philosophies and spiritualities to explore understandings of humanness, being, subjectivity, and the hope of education toward a deepening of our shared humanity. He is the author of Ubuntu and Buddhism in Higher Education, an ontological rethinking, published by Rutledge, and released in November of 2018. He's a native of Galveston, Texas. Our panelists for this evening are Fatima Sheikh, an American author and New Orleans native whose writing explores the human spirit and the intersection of cultures. Her books include the children's titles Malit and the Jazz of Our Street, and for adults, What Went Missing and What Got Found, which is number one on Goodreads' great African-American short story collections list. A former daily reporter for the New Orleans Times-Picayune and desk editor from McGraw Hill World News, she has freelanced for the New York Times, Essence, In These Times, and others. She's a member of the Writer's Room and assistant professor at St. Peter's University. As a co-chair of the Children's and YA book com Books Committee, she is a trustee of Penn American Center. Her first nonfiction book about the free men of color who built Economy Hall will be published by the Historic New Orleans Collection in spring of 2020. Daniel Brook is a journalist and author whose writing has, has appeared in Harper's, The New York Times Magazine, and The Nation. His last book, A History of Future Cities, was long listed for the Lionel Gelber Prize and selected as one of the 10 favorite books of 2013 by The Washington Post. <coughs> Brook's research and writing have been supported by fellowships from institutions including the Library of Congress and Tulane University's New Orleans Center for the Gulf South. His book, The Accident of Color, was extensively researched here at the Williams Research Center, released in early, earlier this year, 2019, uh, and is available in the hallway. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he'll sign it for you if you give it to him, too. Uh, Danson, born in Brooklyn, raised on Long Island, and educated at Yale. He lives here in New Orleans. Finally, Walter Stern is assistant professor of education policy studies and history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. A New Orleans native, he earned his BA in, the American in American Studies from Yale University and his MA and PhD in History from Tulane. Stern's research focuses on the historical intersection of race and education in the urban United States. He is the author of Race and Education in New Orleans, Creating the Segregated City, 1764 to 1960, which received the 2018 Kemper and Leela Williams Prize in Louisiana History, 
which recognizes outstanding contributions to the scholarship in Louisiana history. The book explores the central role that schools played in the development of modern segregated metropolis. He is currently working on a book project on the intertwined history of school desegregation and mass incarceration that seeks to understand the origins and development of punitive policies that criminalize youth of color. His teaching and research interests developed out of his experiences teaching public high school in Mississippi, covering education for a daily newspaper in Georgia, and working as a consultant for multiple education and civil rights initiatives in Louisiana. I'd like to thank you all again for spending your evening with us. And without further ado, David. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, good evening. So I, I come at this topic from a, a bit of a different perspective than uh, my colleagues here on the, on the panel. Um, I come at it from the perspective of a theorist and a philosopher. So you will bear with me. Uh, before we get into theirs, I was trying to lay the groundwork uh, from my understanding of what will uh, get tonight. So as I prepared for the panel, um, I went back and read the works of W.B. Du Bois and the writings of some of our native black uh, radical Creoles, uh, the works of William Watkins and of James Anderson, um, who wrote The Education of Blacks in the South. Um, and what they all sort of brought to mind to me was that history is ever present. Right? It is not something that occurred in the past, but it is always here with us lingering. Um, and it also recalled this, this unbreakable link between education and democratic citizenry. Um, and the ability of ideology to cast a spell uh, on all of us that we just cannot escape. Looking at the writings of the New Orleans Tribune and Le Union, uh, they revealed that people of color, free people of color in New Orleans, um, have always placed great importance on education. Uh, long before the emergence of the Americans, uh, there existed a radical transatlantic Creole tradition. Or as one of my uh, mentors and professors would say, uh, a rogue New Orleans curriculum where uh, the ideas of a nation state of citizenship and education have always already existed outside of modern and American understandings of the same. So tonight we'll uncover this rich history uh, and commitment to education among African Americans and free people of color in New Orleans uh, with Fatima's presentation. And we'll also discover the yet unfolding legacy of the Americans uh, and their narrow dualistic system of racial classification, which would be used deliberately to disenfranchise people of color and to relegate them, both those born free and the newly emancipated, to a second class citizenry following the failure of the Reconstruction era. In Walter's presentation, what we'll uncover is how the system, particularly the education system in New Orleans, served as a tool to maintain segregation and the oppression of an entire group of people. These effects uh, remain today and again are yet unfolding for us. So you might ask why a focus on education? As an education professor, why not? Uh, <laughs> Right, but in education, uh, then like education today, has always been an arena of struggle, a stronghold of power and a result of ideology that allows our minds and therefore our beings to be shaped and altered under the powerful grip of dominating meta narratives. There's an African proverb that says, until the, lion, until the story of the hunt is told by the lion, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. In this country, as we know, the hunter has controlled the story and thus is glorified at the expense of the other experiences of the multiple histories that have been snuffed out by those in power to maintain their power. Tonight, we'll learn about these coexisting histories and the hope that education continues to represent today as it did pre and post Civil War in New Orleans and in the country at large. 
in the spirit of Bill Ayers, who I also read in preparation for tonight's panel, did lots of reading. Uh, uh, education then and now is a contested space, a natural site of conflict, which at times is restrained and more often than not is in full interruption over questions of justice and democracy, which is always community in the making. I argue, as we learn in the works of our scholars this evening, for some, most often those in power, education has been a contested place or a place of struggle because a true education stirs within us the need to look at the world anew, to question everything, to wonder what is worthwhile for human beings to know and experience. It is a space and time where we ask how we might engage, enlarge, and change our lives. And it is then where we confront our dreams and fight out notions of a good life, of freedom, of justice, of living out democracy, and where we try to comprehend, apprehend, or possibly even change the world. Education is power. My hope as an education scholar for tonight is that we understand in the spirit of Sankofa that history is never past, but ever present that our legacy for the struggle of education is rich and our resistance strong. Even more, I want us to deeply understand that if we are to create new models of schooling, insert joke, <laughs> new models of pedagogy, if we are to think about our intellectual work differently, if we are to become architects of a new type of education, then we simply can't continue to repair the structures that have been handed down to us. But in fact, we have to dismantle those structures. But we first have to know what those structures are. Right? And so tonight, we'll get a glimpse uh, at sort of the glory of New Orleans pre-Civil War uh, and moving on to our current day situation, which is not so glorious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to read you something first. This, this came from a pro-slavery pamphlet in 1836, and it, it's a quote. It says, education would become equally dangerous to the master and the slave. It would not only unfit him for his station in life and prepare him for insurrection, but would be found wholly impracticable, impracticable in the performance of the duties of a laborer. Um, so we know with this and the laws in 1830 that said slaves uh, were not allowed to read and write, that uh, this was, it was not encouraged either from the very beginning. Um, this also went for free people of color because free people of color, while they could read and write, were not encouraged to participate as uh, in talking about their situation, uh, not uh, do anything that would cause any insurrection or cause slaves to think very seriously about their condition. And when in 1841 a public school system was created here, it was for whites only. So I'll say all of that by, in, uh, by uh, way of introduction. What I'm gonna talk about tonight are about the people, uh, the, the education and the community that happened in Economy Hall and with the Economy Society. So. Um, I'm a writer, I've, as they were telling me, I've, I've written fiction mostly. This is my first, I was a journalist for a while, but I, I write, um, this is my first nonfiction, complete nonfiction book. So I'm really interested, I was not only interested in history, but I was interested in integrating the stories of the people along with the history, because I think it's easier to remember and we can kind of see how we progress that way. So um, I'm gonna tell you about Economy Hall. It, it started with the Societe d'Economie et de Systems Mutuelle. That was the Economy Society. It started in 1836. And that was the same year that this pro-slavery pamphlet was published. With the Economy Society, one of the first things that they did was they, uh, one of their goals was to educate one another. In, in, in order to educate one another, they built a library. So they had collected books from Europe and they had it uh, in the house that they had on Ursuline Street in 1836. They purchased a house on Ursuline Street, and they brought in uh, the Atlas, they brought in writings of Thomas Jefferson, they brought in the Civil Code, and they had their own library. So their intention was to educate themselves. Um, most of them, well, all of them could read and write because you had to write a letter for application to get there. 
So they, they, you would send in your letter of application, people would decide whether you were worthy enough to be in the society, and if you were, they'd let you in. Um, but that was one of the things that they did. Now, one of the first things I did, because we were focusing on what uh, research we did at the Historic New Orleans Collection, so I did some research at New Orleans Collection. Um, I did a lot of real estate. I was down in the basement of City Hall, and I was all over town, you know, uh, looking for things. So, so um, one of the things, the first things, no, I don't have to do that, right? No, it's the green button is on. It's green, right? Uh, first, I have to learn how to use a uh, clicker. <laughs> Speaking of education, right? Okay. There we go. One of the first things I used um, was just to get an idea of where people were living, right? Because I had this membership. So I had members that, uh, about 15 members in 1836, and I was trying to get an idea of well, where were they located. Uh, I went to lots of places, and people told me that they were basically in the Faubourg Marigny, in the Trimé, and, um, and they said, but not in the French Quarter. Um, I found that not to be true. So I started researching and uh, looked at these places here, if you can see the uh, first and third district there, they were basically there. That most of the people were living around Great Men Street um, and Bagatelle, back in there, the people that were part of the Economy Society. Um, in particular, let me go to my next one, which I don't have to. In particular, this one has, this is a map from uh, 1841 that is so detailed, I, I just love it. Um, I was able to actually look at the names of the streets, count the blocks, sort of see how many houses were on that block around that time, and get an idea of what the landscape was like. In particular, I was looking for a guy named, uh, I'm going to say his name in French, and then I'm going to say it in English, and I'm going to keep saying it in English, OK? <laughs> OK, Luger Bogui, and uh, his name is Luger Bogiel in English, and I will say it in English because I know a lot of Bogiels, and, and they wouldn't recognize it if I was saying Bogui all the time, OK? So um, the uh, uh, Bogiel was at uh, 37 Great Men Street, and he had a school in uh, 1840. So even though slaves couldn't read or write, um, and the economy hall started with its own library, he was teaching in 1840. He had a school with uh, 40 students at uh, 37 Great Men. He had uh, 20 uh, boys and girls that were under the age of 10, and he had 20 that were from 11 to 23 years old. So um, that was a pretty solid school back then. There were, there's a whole number of people who were teaching at that time, but uh, Bogiel was one of the earliest ones. Um, I did, as a writer, what I did was I went, walked up and down the street many times to try to figure out which building it was and um, what may have been there and tried to read what he read at the time. So um, to see what his students were studying. And when my book comes out next year, you'll be able to see what I came out with. <laughs> um, but that was his first school. He was, what you'll see in Karen Kose Bell's uh, book, um, Revolution, Romanticism in the Afro-Creole Protest Tradition, I think that's the right, uh, the right order. Um, the, uh, she mentions Bogio as, as being one of the first five people to teach at the Couvent School. So you know, the Couvent School was the uh, institute, the Catholic institute that was opened. Uh, in, uh, a group of people got together in 1847. It was opened in 1848, and he was one of the first teachers there. Um, the other teachers that were members of the Economy Society, and it's sort of natural that these people would sort of gather together, were uh, Etienne Codeviol, uh, Nelson Fauché, uh, Joseph Jean-Pierre Lena. Um, there were, I'm sorry, they were members of the economy who helped get the school founded. There were three members of the economy that helped get the school founded. The people who taught there that were economists were Joseph Levine, Adolf Duhart's wife, Nelson Fauché, William Vigors, Henry Louis Ray. So these people were very much involved in education. And as you know, the, um, so even though public education was not available to them, what they were doing was having a lot of private schooling. So they, there were private schools, and the Catholics had a lot of uh, schools too, which I won't go because I'm going to just stay the economy society. I'll just veer off everywhere, you know. Um, so, um, but there were the Catholics took care of a lot of the free people of color. Um, uh, these private schools took care of free people of color. And Bogio himself, uh, it was in Harper's Magazine in 1866. Maybe you guys might have read that. Um, that he was interviewed by a, a writer from Harper's, and he talked about a school, the time that he had a slave that he brought into his school, because the, uh, the slave master wanted the child uh, to learn. 
And what he found out was, well, what he found in his school was that the other students didn't really want to be educated alongside a slave. Um, because there, there was a, a sort of loophole that if the master said it was okay, you could educate them. But in terms of the uh, families, they didn't want to be educated um, next to a slave. So anyway, he continued to uh, teach this person privately. So even though, I guess I'm saying this to say that a lot of times we will hear things like, uh, oh, there were no free people of color in the French Quarter, or slaves were not taught, or there are so many exceptions to that. And, and yeah, there are many nuances. And as a writer, I was able to plumb these nuances. You know, I was able to look at this in, in a sort of nuanced way because I'm talking about the territory of the heart and not necessarily all of the facts, right? Not every single bit of data. Oh, there is quite a bit of data. Um, the, uh, let me see. Yes, the, okay, so one of the people, let me see if I can go to my C here. Okay, uh, because here's, my, here's some data for y'all. Um, in 1850, the literacy rate in New Orleans for free blacks was twice that of whites. Um, no, no. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is the wrong one. In 1850, it was 77% of blacks were literate compared to 88% of whites in terms of literacy, right? Uh, illiteracy, that's right. Um, and there were uh, 11,000 illiterate whites and 3,000 illiterate free blacks. So you, you'll see in terms of statistics, what I'm saying to you, because it's hard to hear statistics. What I'm saying to you is people will say that there was a very low literacy rate for free blacks compared to whites. Wasn't that low, wasn't that much difference between the two. However, the populations were bigger. So there were a lot more uh, whites than there were free blacks, right? Yeah, free people of color. So um, I'll give you the numbers again. 77.2% of blacks were literate, free blacks, uh, uh, and 88.4% of whites. But there were 11,000 liter illiterate whites and almost 3,000 illiterate free people of color. So the, so the numbers are, the numbers, the, the numbers that you'd say, I don't want to belabor this too much, but you can look at the numbers and see that there was a lot of reading going on, right? There was still reading going on, even though it wasn't in the public sphere. Um, uh, just to stir you all up a little bit, because there are a few things that stirred me up. Uh, one of the things that happened in Economy Hall, let me see if I'm at Economy Hall yet. Nope, I'm going backwards. Okay, there's Economy Hall. So this group, the economy of oh, five minutes, okay. This group, the Economy Society, built their hall in 1857, right? So we're still before the Civil War. In 1857, they built the hall and people came there to have meetings uh, and some of the meetings were about suffrage for, vote for the vote for uh, people of color, right? And free blacks when the Civil War ended. I'm, I'm sorry, and blacks when the Civil War ended. Um, one of the things I want you, uh, there, when this question was going on, a fellow named Francois Boisdere, who was one of the uh, members of the economy, said that uh, when men come here from Ireland or Germany, they are not treated like puppies. Uh, after they have been here a certain length of time, they are admitted to all the rights of freemen. Go to the registration office and see the crosses there of Irishmen and Germans who cannot write their names. There are no such men here. So they were pretty outdone, the fact that they were literate and they could not get the vote and that people who d were illiterate could get the vote. So this was, this was in uh, 1863. That's when that was going on. Um, let me go quickly, because I'm getting to my, um, the, uh, there was another, uh, the meeting that came there when um, the Friends of Universal Suffrage met there and the Friends of Universal Suffrage became the Republican Party, the Radical Republican Party. Um, and, Oscar Dunn was there, who was uh, the first elected black lieutenant governor of the United States. He met right there at Economy Hall. And I'm trying to give you just a little bit about the philosophy, because the philosophy was to educate each other, then to get that political power that they needed, right, and to become full parties in the American uh, dream, basically. Uh, and Dunn said, part of the platform, all men are created equal. It is the boast and glory of the American Republic that there is no discrimination among men, no privileges founded upon birthright. There are no hereditary distinctions. Nobility is unknown. Not a single public office is transmitted from father to son. Not even the highest office in this empire, this country being a republic and not a monarchy. 
Every career, every pursuit in life is open to the humblest as well as the most exalted citizens. So little is the importance of birth considered that a self-made man is viewed with more esteem and respect than the citizen born and raised in affluence and prosperity. So that was him. Uh, I will tell you, to, to keep on my time, I'll tell you that uh, Bogio went to, uh, he opened after his school downtown, he had a, a Republican school, he had a Freedman school, and he worked uh, for quite a while in the Freedmen's Association and with the Economy Society. So I will stop there, except for this one little picture. Nope, not that picture. <laughs> that picture. The Economy Hall stood until 1965. So it was on that one block in, uh, in the Treme for more than 100 years. Uh, and that community existed for a long time. I bet you if you look around this room long enough, you'll see a lot of people who are part of that community. So. Enjoy, and I'll talk to you later. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Fatma. Um, <clears throat> just to uh, bring the largest possible perspective, just keep keep in mind what uh, she began with, which is that the school district here, the public school district here, was founded as a whites-only district, entirely whites-only district, not just the individual schools, only whites-only schools. Uh, in the 1840s, and my uh, research and my presentation is going is going to discuss um, the period when the school district, at the height of radical reconstruction, was desegregated uh, from roughly 18 from 1871 to 1877, and then resegregated in 1877. Uh, when I was writing this book in uh, Microsoft Word. Uh, every time I wrote the word resegregated, I got that little red line that uh, they're telling me that, oh, that's not really a word. And, and I think it's, it's very telling uh, about the American mindset and its blind spots that uh, we, can only, we can only desegregate things. We can't resegregate them. Think, progress can only go one way. Unfortunately, in the period I was writing about, it did not. Um, I came to this uh, as a, a journalist and author who writes books about uh, urban studies. Uh, and I just happened upon it. I, when I moved here in 2011, I thought I should read up on the Ruby Bridges era in the 1960s school desegregation. And I put into a social science and history search engine, New Orleans and school desegregation, and got 100 hits, 99 of which were about the 1960s, and one of which was about the 1870s. And I'd had no idea that the school district here had been desegregated in the 1870s. So that was the one that I clicked. I initially went from my research to the library at UNO, which houses the Orleans Parish School Board records. And I requested the volume for the period from 1871 to 1877 for the period of desegregation, and was presented with a ledger book where the dates were 1865 to 1870 and 1877 to 1878. The records that I wanted to read had all been expunged from the archive. So then I found my way here um, and to some of the treasures of the historic New Orleans collection. Uh, one way to research this is through this series of documents, which the collection holds pretty much for every year, which is a report of the state superintendent of public education to the General Assembly. And you get a real sense of just how, almost a sense of whiplash, of how quickly you go from uh, an immediate post-Civil War period where uh, with whites only voting and white supremacists in power to a very quick and in many ways very successful desegregation period and then a flip back very quickly uh, at the end of Reconstruction. Uh, these documents contain budgetary figures and enrollment data that would be very useful to someone writing an academic article. For me, I was drawn to the rhetoric in them. Um, the, 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 the state superintendent in 1867 is a man named Robert Mills Lusher. Um, and he is, he is morally uh, not a very good person, but he is <laughs> rhetorically very skilled. Uh, and in the uh, document that I quote in my book, uh, he, he describes the purpose of public schools as, quote, to vindicate the honor and supremacy of the Caucasian race unquote, and to stymie, quote, the mental training of an inferior race. Um, the key, beyond this, at LSU in the archive, he has a handwritten autobiography that runs about 20 or 30 pages, 
where he writes about himself in the third person and talks about segregated education as the great cause of his life. Uh, so this is not a quote pulled out of context. Now by 1874, you have a man named William G. Brown in this position, state elected to statewide office. He's originally from New Jersey. He's of mixed race. He is educated in the Caribbean. And he, with equal uh, eloquence, speaks of the success the school district here in New Orleans, the only district in the state or the entire South that is desegregated in this period, uh, is having. He says in this document from 1874, quote, I am aware that the old leaven of prejudice because of race, et cetera, has not entirely disappeared, unquote. But he was heartened that the process was underway. If a single generation could be raised in integrated schools, Brown believed, the cycle of hatred, mistrust, and violence could be broken forever. Quote, my officers are not influenced by the smiles or frowns of the narrow-minded and prejudiced, he intoned. Would that we had more of them, and we soon will have, for it needs but five or six years more of labor like that performed in the state during the past three years, then our own schools will have developed them. Of course, he does not get those five or six more years that he, he asked for. Uh, by 1877, the schools have been resegregated. As I dove into the actual life of the schools in this period, uh, it became clear to me that the way I was sort of looking at race as a 21st century American uh, is more, res more a result of how this period pans out than how it was going into it. Uh, other histor many historians have picked up on this. C. Van Woodward in The Strange Career of Jim Crow famously notes that the racial definitions of a white person and a colored person are formulated after the Jim Crow laws, not before them. So first, states start passing laws about what white people and colored people can and cannot do. Only after those laws are on the books, the question becomes, well, what is a, a white person? What is a colored person? And you see that play out in the schools uh, in these uh, sort of issues of mistaken identity that plague them. Uh, at the very beginning of Reconstruction, which here we really should date from 1862, not 1865. So Louisiana secedes from the Union in 1861, but just over a year later, New Orleans is retaken by the Union. Uh, and, and a process of reconstruction before the term reconstruction is coined is happening here. And immediately there's, uh, there are efforts by Creole of Color community members to enroll in the schools. I'm gonna read a, a brief passage from my book about that. When the public schools opened in September 15, on September 15, 1862, a mysterious new teacher, one Miss Snyder, was presiding over a classroom at the Barrack School. Emboldened by her own hiring, Snyder, who was secretly biracial, encouraged her relatives to send their light-skinned free children of color to the school as well. Cited in the French Quarter, the heart of the old Creole city, the Barrack School for Girls was among the softest of racial targets. Even decades later, at the height of Jim Crow, the officially whites-only academy was Anglo-free, known as, quote, being patronized solely by the French-speaking children and those of the other Latin races. Which is interesting, even under Jim Crow, there's still the rhetoric of the Latin races as a kind of sub-white ethnicity. Uh, that document's also from the collection. Uh, soon after the 1862 school year began, gossip began to swirl about Miss Snyder's ancestry. By the end of the first week of classes, the city school board had convened a racial inquisition a special three-member probe and panel to get to the bottom of, quote, rumors spreading about this city that Miss Snyder is not of white origin, unquote. Embracing bureaucratic caution, the school board investigative committee ordered that Miss Snyder be fired, but not informed of why she was being dismissed. The investigative committee then turned its attention to the student body. Administrators ordered the principal of the barracks school, Josephine Mataska, hauled in for questioning. Under examination, Principal Metaska copped to having accidentally enrolled three students of color, the Augustan sisters, aged seven, eight, and 14. The sisters Metaska conceded, quote, are very dark, unquote, but she maintained that, quote, on admitting them, I had no suspicion that they might be colored, unquote. <laughs> it was all Miss Snyder's fault, Metaska told the committee. The mendacious <laughs> teacher had misled her by denying that she even knew the sisters, let alone was related to them. It was only after realizing that the girls were, quote, friends, even cousins to Miss Snyder, Metaska explained, that she decided to, quote, make inquiry into what they may be, unquote. The principal scoured the neighborhood and interviewed a man named Leonville Pascal, who was rumored to be the father of the Augustine children. Though light-skinned, Metaska explained, Pascal was, quote, known to be a colored man. Now, suspicious that the children had falsified their surnames to obscure their racial background, Metaska summarily dismissed them. 
When the board's investigators finally located the sisters' birth certificates, they found that they were, their parents indeed were, quote, of color. This, go, this types of mix-ups go on and on. Uh, in 1868, there's another uh, situation with 29 students of unknown racial background, and the school board goes in and, and attempts to pull their pedigrees, sends out form letters like, the pupil blank is named as belonging to this class of students. Uh, uh, said pupils being a mixed race and this school having been designated formally for white children, please present uh, documentary evidence to 39 Burgundy Street before 2 p.m. Tuesday the 26th or we will expel your child. Um, and those letters are all preserved um, in, in the records until this, the, this district is desegregated. That happens over uh, winter break from 1870 to 1871. In the fall of 1870, there's a case that finally, uh, led by a Creole of color uh, mixed race member of the state house, uh, Robert Isabel, who uh, successfully wins his case on behalf of his child, and the schools are desegregated. Uh, progress was swift, quote um, from the book. Shortly after winter break, a conservative newspaper lamented that, quote, there is not a single white school in the city, we would venture to say, that does not contain at least one colored child. At the close of the school year, a local African-American newspaper celebrated that integrated schools were, quote, accomplished facts, which in their very nature are irreversible. Um, so now at this point, you might think that uh, the schools have been integrated and everything gets simple in terms of uh, race in New Orleans, but actually gets a lot more complicated. All of a sudden, this conservative newspaper is now maintaining that every school in New Orleans has been desegregated which means that there's at least one student of color in every school in New Orleans, which spurs white supremacists to, to, you know, to action to try to resegregate the schools and figure out in each school which of the students are the ones who are not white. Uh, this is covered uh, an article in December of, of in, in December 1874, there's a wildcat action to try to resegregate the schools and it's written up in Harper's uh, for a national audience. The reporter notes, quote, uh, Given the, quote, mixture of all shades and colors, including Indians and even Chinese, nowhere, indeed, would it be so difficult and invidious to establish a government founded upon a distinction of color as in New Orleans. Here, all shades and tints are blended in harmonious confusion. The dark bronze of the Creole inhabitants, the descendants of French and Spanish blood, is sometimes a deeper shade than the traits of Negro descent. And even the pure Caucasian, white and red, from the misty clime of England, grows tawny and atrabilious beneath the sun. <laughs> and there are persons of Negro descent apparently so purely white as to surpass, in this particular, the emigrants from New York and Connecticut. Uh, so when this, these teenage boys rampage through the schools trying to resegregate them, uh, they run into a lot of trouble. They uh, mistake some Jewish students for Creoles of color. Their mothers get very angry and complain to the school board. They also try to expel uh, the, the daughter of a prominent white supremacist. Uh, <laughs> She says to them, do you, quote, according to Harper's, do you know who I am? And they say, no, the regulator in charge responds, nor do I have any desire to know you. You are a Negro and you must leave this school. She says, a Negro, she screams, I am the daughter of your leader. <laughs> um, and in fact, she is the daughter of the leader and a mixed race uh, concubine from the days of Plassage. Uh, so that, so all of the above are, are true. Um, and then here in the collection, there was, I uh, found a reminiscence of this incident in a diary uh, of a woman who was born in 1860, a, well, let's say a white identified woman, for lack of a better term, um, born in 1860. She's 14 when her school uh, is faced with, 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 is regulated with the regulators and this controversy over who is white. Uh, and this document is up there. She says that uh, she and her fellow students, quote, formed um, into a mass armed with broomsticks, and they began harassing and pushing the girls that they believed to be of color out. And then on the next page, this was very interesting to me, it says that, um, quote, our parents were afraid of mob violence, but the men of New Orleans stood behind us, gave us badges to wear, and thus we were protected. And I thought that was fascinating, the idea of the badges. So presumably by some either through pedigree or some physical examination, these students had been adjudicated white. Uh, according to the man who invented the one drop rule, um, you could spot people of any African descent, even 1 32nd, by examining their feet. Um, so that was another method that was used. 
Uh, and then uh, finally, in this period, the, the uh, Latin American system of race is truly expunged. The French language newspaper puts out an editorial. It says, it's time to say it plain. One must be either white or black. Let each man decide. There are two races here, one of them superior, the other inferior. Their separation is absolutely necessary. Let's split from now on into two. Uh, later that year, the, the paper Le Carillon, is the French newspaper, offered a new set of racial boundaries that cross lines of nationality, language, religion, and skin tone. In a pseudoscientific disquisition on race, Le Carillon pleaded no contest to the idea that Spaniards had mixed with Arabs during the century long, centuries long Moorish occupation of the Iberian Peninsula, but regardless, the paper insisted, Spaniards remained white. Quote, our fellow Spanish citizens are descended to a large extent from Arabs, but Arabs are white the newspaper informed its readers, just tanned by exposure to light and to the sun, as are all whites who live out in the open in hot countries such as the Jews. Okay, so then we've now expanded whiteness, um, and finally we begin, we then have to redefine creoleness. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm almost done. Um, and you see this expansion of whiteness uh, in the roles of the White League. So the White League, unlike the Klan, does not wear masks. They parade in the open. Um, and then after they retake power, they actually publish their roles. Uh, so this is the first Crescent City Regiment, which is, as it says, a re, it's just a rebranding of the White League. It says, I don't know if this has a pointer, but it says uh, the White League. And here you see, um, you see the names of the, of the members, and you have the names you would, the last names you would expect, like Richards and Smith, but you also have, and these are direct quotes, you have Garcia and Hyman also in the White League. Um, this document is, is, is over there. So you can see the expansion of whiteness in this period. Um, and then the erasure of Creole identity as a Creole of, the concept of Creoles of color. This is 10 years later. This is now 1886, 10 years after the collapse of Reconstruction. This is a document also up there. Uh, these are the bylaws of the Creole Association of Louisiana, uh, quoting from my book. In 1886, the city's leading French and Spanish families formed the Creole Association of Louisiana so that the, quote, descendants of the original Creoles of Louisiana could disseminate knowledge concerning the true origin and real character of the Creole race of Louisiana, unquote. The organization barred mixed race Creoles of color from joining while opening its memberships to, quote, all white male persons of age and of good standing, unquote, even if they had no French or Spanish ancestry at all, so long as they were, quote, desirous to cooperate in disseminating, disseminating knowledge of the true character and origin and in furthering the advancement of the Creole race, unquote. To join the Creole Association of Louisiana, one need not actually be Creole. One simply need be white. Uh, and at this point, now we have seen the, the boundaries of whiteness and blackness formed. We can pass it along to Walter, who will show how these identities were etched into the map of New Orleans. Well, thank you. Well, thank you all for coming out. It's really exciting to have a packed room uh, like this. I want to thank the, the, the collection and my fellow panelists. It's exciting to be able to uh, talk about this topic across a really long period of, of time uh, and from different perspectives. One theme that I think uh, came out in Fatima and, and, and Dan's uh, talks that I'll try to uh, elaborate upon um, is that uh, our understanding of, of, of race and, and the, the way that it often manifests itself in terms of uh, bolstering white supremacy uh, and, and the subordination of African Americans, it took a lot of work. Uh, it was not something that, that simply occurred. Uh, and also, in New Orleans, perhaps uh, even more so than, than other places, it was fiercely contested uh, at every step of the way uh, by people who were, were deemed of color or, or, or black or African American. Um, and so that's something that um, I'll try to elaborate upon, uh, focusing really on the period uh, in the kind of early to mid 20th century, particularly between the world wars. And the, the big point that, that I wanna make uh, is that Segregated schools, which during the period uh, you know, following what Dan was talking about in 1877, the school board literally took its list of, of schools and reassigned uh, racial categories to, to schools. Um, and so uh, the, the point I want to make is that uh, segregated schools 
had uh, much greater consequences beyond education. Segregated schools helped to segregate the city uh, uh, residentially uh, across the board uh, and, and implemented really dramatic change in not just residential pattern, but the allocation of resources to areas that came to be identified as white neighborhoods and those that came to be identified as black neighborhoods. And schools were drivers and school policy were drivers of this process. Um, and in, in, in doing so, uh, of public officials, but the state, uh, local, national level, um, did this ongoing work uh, of giving meaning to race, of making the distinction, the made up distinction, black or white, have very real material meaning and consequences. Um, and the, the, the process that uh, I'll talk about and that I look at uh, further in, in, in my book of segregated schools helping to create and institutionalize segregated neighborhoods and to institutionalize white supremacy. It was a, a, a dynamic process. It was often uh, improvisational uh, in that African Americans were challenging efforts uh, to be denied opportunity, were challenging uh, oppression and, and, and inequality. And whites in power, as well as white residents who recognized the value that came to them by being identified as white, uh, responded to those African-American challenges and would constantly kind of try, try to come up with, with new ways to reinforce the supremacy of whites and the subordination of African-Americans. So talking about this in terms of uh, segregated schools and how they had impacts on the geography of New Orleans and the segregation of New Orleans neighborhoods, there were sort of three main things that, that happened, and I'll talk about it generally first, and then share some of the resources I use from here at the collection to talk about specific examples. Um, so what policymakers did was they, during particularly this period of following World War I, when there was a rise, a significant rise in public school enrollment, um, and, and therefore public school construction, um, uh, as the system was expanding, officials pushed black schools into the least desirable, oldest neighborhoods of the city, while simultaneously building white schools in areas that had not yet even been developed. So after World War I, much of what had been back swamp was uh, drained due to the, the, the wood pump and the in, 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 in introduction of the pumping system that we still very much depend on and hope uh, <laughs> continues to work. As the city was expanding, the, t the school board was the first one in, identifying these new areas for white schools. And so as schools were being shifted to certain geographic areas, uh, what happened with, with resources and investment, both from the city as well as private investment, uh, was dramatically different for those areas with white schools and those with black schools. Resources, zoning protections flowed to areas with white schools, and then the schools also attracted residents who then moved in and, and, and developers who started building houses around those areas. Um, meanwhile, areas that got black schools uh, in what had been a fairly residentially uh, mixed or integrated city, um, the black schools gave areas that beforehand did not have racial identities, it gave them racial identities. And as they became identified as black neighborhoods, they were star not just starved of, of, of resources, they were actually targeted for destruction and redevelopment. And so in areas that got white schools, neighborhoods were built up around those areas and were showered with public resources um, areas that, that had black schools were targeted for destruction. Um, and uh, a few other sort of kind of big picture points to, to think about before I go into examples. Um, you know, I, the, my work is, is really hyper-localized and then I look at specific New Orleans neighborhoods, get down to the, the level of individual blocks and who lived on the, the, the blocks and sort of what happened as, as school came to a neighborhood or racial designations were changed. But it was also, it's also a policy story. And it's a story involving uh, not just school officials in New Orleans, um, officials in the city government, um, but also the federal government. The federal government played a huge role uh, through the creation of segregated public housing and also through, during the New Deal and beyond, um, into the, the post-World War II era, uh, providing um, uh, support for white people to buy housing in racially segregated neighborhoods. And as the federal government was uh, deciding which areas it would invest in and where it would back loans, the availability of schools and the availability of racially and socioeconomically segregated schools was a very important thing. And so this was some, the federal government played a huge role uh, really in nationalizing not just housing segregation, but school segregation uh, as, as well. Um, 
So that's an, a point to remember. Also, something that I won't get to talk about as much given the time limits today, but I'm talking at, at the sort of policy level and the imposition of white supremacy and segregation through schooling. It's important to remember that African Americans resisted the, the maneuverings of these policymakers who had significantly more power, and African Americans maneuvered within what power they could find. Um, and within segregated black schools and the increasingly segregated neighborhoods they were located in, uh, the schools and the communities were really sustaining one another. James Anderson, who, uh, excuse me, who David mentioned in the, his introduction, who wrote a book, The Education of Blacks in the South, talked about this concept of double taxation. So during Jim Crow, uh, African Americans were, were paying taxes, uh, as white people were paying taxes, uh, but scholars like W.E.B. Du Bois, early in the 20th century, uh, documented that African Americans weren't even getting back as much in funding for segregated black schools as they paid in in, in taxes. Um, so African Americans were already getting cheated on, on that front and in many others. Um, additionally, African Americans would pull their money together don't buy land, donate it to the school board, and say, we want a school, we need a school, and the school board often would not act until communities, and in the seventh ward, what a great example has happened with Valina C. Jones School. Uh, and so through things like that, you know, we think of segregated schooling, we often think um, that it was horrendously unequal, and it was. But within this unequal space and system of Jim Crow, African Americans were building thriving, strong institutions, uh, and, and often with the purpose of challenging that uh, oppressive system in which they were operating. Um, and then two other kind of bigger points to keep in mind. You know, one has to do with why does this story of school segregation and housing segregation matter today? Um, one is that you know, there's a persistent uh, wealth gap between whites and African Americans. Home ownership is often the, si the single largest source of, of individual wealth. And this legacy of official policy, again, at the, the local level up to the federal level, enabling some people to benefit from government services financially by owning homes and supporting the development of neighborhoods that then became higher valued while neglecting others, is a significant driver behind this wealth gap today. And there's a, a renewed discussion, one that's been going on for 150, more than 150 years of, of reparations, and it's something to, to, to keep in mind as you follow that debate in the news that you know, this is a problem that was created through official policy over time. Um, another thing that I think is relevant uh, for today in thinking about how this history unfolds is we often hear rhetoric about, you know, taxpayers and tax eaters, or you know, people who receive government handouts, and why would, you know, why would we give a handout to this, this group? You know, my, my people never took a handout. You know, this is a story of, and, and there's an urban historian, David Freund, who refers to, to federal housing policy as you know, a form of socialism for white people. This is a story of intense government involvement to benefit you know, particular people at the expense of, of others. And so, I'll turn to um, some examples and sort of using um, some of the sources that are up at the table or that I uh, use at the collection, give a little insight into sort of how I did this research and how I put the project together. So the, I wanted to start with this first source. Uh, this is from a WPA survey of housing in New Orleans from 1939. It's households by race. The darker colors are uh, showing the concentration of the African American population. Um, this is right before public housing complex, segregated public housing complexes were built, which uh, exacerbated this segregation. Um, and over time, the, um, the city became more segregated, but this was a huge change from what had existed uh, 20, 30 years before. You know, this concentration around Central City and then into the 6th, 7th uh, Ward, um, it, again, did not simply happen by chance, by individuals deciding, oh, I like people who look like me, I'm gonna live here. This was, was a created uh, problem. And again, schools were, were, were part of that. Um, and so one of the starkest examples uh, that I like to talk about is um, the creation of what in the, the, the modern area, in the 20th century, was the first African school, high school for African Americans in New Orleans, McDonough 35. So 
McDonough 35 was created in 1917. Um, there had been, up to that point, uh, no high school for African Americans. In fact, uh, at, around the turn of the century, the, public sc the, the school board eliminated education for African Americans uh, above the fifth grade for reasons similar to those that Robert Lusher uh, articulated uh, in, the, in the, the quote that Dan shared. The, the board blatantly said, they said, look, we want to educate African Americans for, for their station in life. And we think they should do manual labor, uh, menial work, so we're not gonna give education beyond fifth grade. Through the activism of black parents, particularly black mothers, uh, grades were restored. But it wasn't until 1917 that there was a high school. There's a need for a space, not just for a school, but for uh, an overcrowded elementary school near what became, near the site of what became McDonough 35. Um, so there's a school, uh, a white elementary school at Rampart and Gerard. It's now a, a parking garage. Um, and it's across from this sort of booming South Market District area. Um, anyway, the, the school board said, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna move black children to this school. White residents of that neighborhood went up in arms. They said, this is a white neighborhood. You can't do this. And the debate was very interesting for several reasons. Um, on the one hand, white residents uh, who were disproportionately Eastern Euro Jewish Eastern European immigrants who owned uh, stores along Rampart Street. Um, on the one hand, they were completely lying when they said they lived in a uh, white neighborhood. And I sort of went through thousands and thousands of entries of, of census records and saw the area was incredibly mixed. You know, you could sort of walk through the area. There's no way to say it was white, black, Italian, Russian. You could find, you know, every, everyone there. Um, so they were lying on the one hand, but on the other hand, they, they understood the, the racist logic of, of property values, or the, the racial theory of property values, and they worried, if we lose this white school, we're gonna, there goes the neighborhood. And uh, unfortunately, they were right. So what I have here, this is uh, 1908. The circled uh, property on, on the map is a Sanborn fire insurance map, a great resource for researching the history of your home, for researching uh, change over time in the built environment. Um, that's McDon what was McDonough 13, a white elementary school. Um, and you can see that they're a mix of housing and stores uh, around it. So in 1917, this became a black school, McDonough 35. And almost immediately, within a year after it becoming a school, the neighborhood completely changed because the city began building a train station to just to your left of the school, uh, railroad sheds to the, the north of it, um, and, and literally the neighborhood was torn down uh, around the school. Um, you know, and as I said, that you know, African Americans contested uh, this form of oppression uh, it, through Jim Crow, McDonough 35 is an example of this, because as the neighborhood is literally being torn down around it, it became perhaps the, the shining example of the entire uh, school system, um, and producing many, many graduates, Dutch Morial, Max Spears, many others, had an, the most educated African Americans in the city were teaching uh, at McDonough 35, OCW Taylor, who was the editor of Louisiana Weekly, Charles Rousseff, and on and on. Um, and so within this space of Jim Crow, African Americans were building strong institutions. Um, there are other examples that I have, but for sake of time, I'm just gonna kind of touch on uh, the sources. Um, I have and allow you to, to look at them further up, up here. Um, another map I used, you can't really see much from the slide. This is a map in the collection of this same area. McDonough 35 would be, I believe, just down here. Um, but from 1947, what stood out to me was these areas up here were targeted for still more demolition. This is where roughly our city hall is uh, today. This map also had the owners of property along Rampart Street. And one thing that really stood out to me uh, was that those same Jewish families that owned stores, many of them still owned the property. And they continued to essentially profit off of segregation through catering to African-American clientele, but they had been able to leave the neighborhood um, often with governmental support through FHA loans and zoning protections that went to areas with white uh, schools in Broadmoor and other port parts uptown. And so I was able to trace some of these individuals over time as well as the, the building. The, the point I'll end on uh, is really just to 
second something David said in, in, in getting us started, and that is that, you know, one reason, one of the many reasons to study the past and to study systems of oppression and how racial inequality was created uh, is that if we understand how this was, you know, how, the, how this was built, then we could figure out how to, to take it apart. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately, the story that, that I tell is, is one of intense effort and investment into to building uh, a system that elevated people who were viewed and identified as white while trying to subordinate uh, people who were identified as African American. And so hopefully by looking backwards, we can, we can help uh, you know, figure out ways to, to dismantle those structures today. So thank you. Um, so the, the, the phrase du double taxation uh, comes, to, to the best of my knowledge, from a historian, James Anderson, um, who's now dean of the uh, College of Education at University of Illinois. Um, but Du Bois in uh, his Atlanta University studies, um, uh, one, uh, one titled the, the Negro in the Common Schools, Du Bois documented the uh, disparities in what African Americans were, were paying in taxes and, and for schooling and what they were getting in, in return. Uh, and so the, 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 the term, he, he did not, to my knowledge, use the term double taxation. That was applied retroactively. But he uh, helped document uh, the, the ways that African Americans were, were being cheated in terms of uh, investment in segregated uh, schooling. Um, and he, and, and particularly the, uh, the black press, black newspapers across the country, documented and, and wrote about the, the various forms of donations that African-American communities made in order to, to get schools. And so the, the, the investments on top of those taxes that were already being paid. As a teacher in the charter school systems now in New Orleans, my question for you or any of you would be, what now can we do in the school system to start dismantling these systems that are oppressing people of color? OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a shot. OK. <laughs> that. I'm, I'm here, so I'll take a shot at it. Now, not in terms of dismantling the schools necessarily, right off the bat, but I'll tell you one thing that, that really worked, would seem to work in the uh, 19th century with strong communities. And, uh, well, I'm in favor of public schools because you had public schools with communities, that teachers that lived in the communities, uh, people at families that knew the teachers and that sort of thing. So I think one of the things that, and I don't know, I'm, I'm just talking, <laughs> but one of the things that I think that, uh, could happen is that kids don't get bussed around so much, that they can go to local schools, that the schools that are nearby to them, they can walk to, that their teachers can live nearby, that their families can know their teachers. So is that dismantling it? I don't think that's dismantling it. But I know that from, the commu from looking at the economy society, one of the things that they did is they established a very strong community. They would educate each other, they would help each other, they helped each other with loans, they helped each other build houses, 
you know, so they, they leaned on each other and they all lived near each other. So I think that, that helps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to add with that one too. Yeah. So a, a, a huge part of dismantling, especially in the education system, um, is recognizing the need for culture and relevant pedagogy, right? And folks who understand the environment that they're going to be teaching um, and looking at and recognizing the humanity of the students and parents um, that they're going to set. Um, education of yourself in a, a adopting environment is extremely important. Uh, have the system. And what I'm finding talking to teachers who are in the system is that they don't necessarily understand, one, the historical aspects of uh, the system of oppression that they're entering in. They don't understand um, the, the gravity of the vocation they enter. Right? It's more than just a job, or should be. Um, and they don't understand how their daily interactions with their students, especially um, students of color, impact them and how they see themselves. Right? So these are ways that we uh, continue, we continue to impact the being of students every day, right? which keeps them in this, this sort of cycle of system. Um, the, the best thing I say for educators, especially educators who are white, is to call it out and see it. Um, that's the most powerful thing within the system I think you can do at this point, right? Because folks are tired of hearing that people look like me, um, and they, they turn deaf eventually. But if you um, happen to be a white male who is a teacher, will call it out, folks will start to, to raise their eyes. I have one comment as well. Um, just as historians can look at how race is created, over periods of history, I think educators can look at how race is learned at different ages for a, a child. Um, and again, this is, this is not what I do, but, um, but, but surely there are ways of intervening at different stages at sort of age appropriate levels to at least um, you know, make the child think a little more critically about the racial messages that we all learn as Americans growing up. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Tina, the work mm -hmm. of reference, is it a predecessor to the William Boy and the Talented Ten, about uh, 30 years prior? The, um, the which work? When you're talking about how they were educating specific oh. populations, kind right. of similar to what Du Bois mm, promoted <laughs> with educating the Talented Ten. So they doing that already in New Orleans before Du Bois put that out for Town, Town to Tenth was what, 1880s, 1900? 1905. 1905, yeah. Yeah, well, the, the, the Economy Society started in 1836. Right. So it was quite, so a, quite a while earlier. Way ahead of that. So yeah, it was quite a while. What was actually ahead of? Well, his, that, that Town to Tenth is a, is a concept of, uh, of education, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that in Philadelphia and places like that, they, they had education, you know, early on too, you know? So I would, I would be remiss to, to, to make a statement to say that the education system for uh, free blacks in New Orleans was earlier than the education system for free blacks in Philadelphia. I'd have to really look that up. But I know that by the time he wrote The Talented Tenth, we had been uh, educating our own. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I, would just, I would just add that rhetorically, uh, the language that many Creoles of color used in, in, talk, in, in linking educational and po political rights, um, it, it did in many ways foreshadow uh, du, du Bois. Yes. And I think Fatima's right to sort of, it's, you know, it's nice to celebrate when New Orleans is in the, the vanguard of, of, of something, <laughs> yeah. and, and we should, uh, but the, 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 the dynamics that we're talking about um, did exist in other, in other cities in terms of the roles that black schooling was playing in, in building and sustaining black communities, mm -hmm. um, just as efforts to, to segregate and, and use education as a tool of, of oppression existed in places like Philadelphia uh, and, and Boston, as, you know, as well as in New Orleans. I, I also think it's worth noting that the, uh, the fusion between the Creole of color community and the larger African American community doesn't really fully take shape here till after Reconstruction collapses. So, I mean, I wish we could go in a time machine and interview someone from the Economy <laughs> Society in 1840, but I think the idea that, oh, you're a credit to your race, um, I think he would have probably some 
prickly things to say about that uh, if you were lumped in with the just the way we conceive of blackness today. I'll, I'll just I'll just add a little bit to that. Some of that fusion did happen earlier, though. It uh, it happened in the economy hall with these political rallies that they yeah. had because the the rallies for suffrage were happening early on. They were happening before the end of the Civil War, and everyone was invited. In fact, they'll say people of all classes are invited, so mm -hmm. people were coming in. So even though they um, they marched together and they they got things done after the Civil War, more done after the Civil War, they actually had been talking for maybe a yeah. couple of decades Begin before It's that. beginning yeah. really right. from the Louisiana Purchase, that's the initial impetus to, yeah, to cons consolidate, and it's a, pro it's a process. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah, yeah. not just not yeah, no, no. do it all. It seems to me that listening to you all that the linchpin to the solution that someone asked about is putting into reverse all the economic incentives that flow to segregated educational opportunities. I kind of want to stand here trying to enumerate those and tell you how I've done them. That's, yeah. That, it seems to me, is the long term solution. I don't know exactly how you can accomplish that politically, but some. Uh, I, I, I agree. Part of the, um, the, the movement toward racial equity has to be an economic argument, right? Because the consequence has been economics for so long. And we've tried to appeal to the hearts of men, right? That didn't work. So that's a guilt to the body books. Maybe we'll get some results. <laughs> the next I, panel will be a panel of economists. I, I, would just, I would just say, and I think politically it's quite difficult, but yeah. um, you know, there, there's a, a long-standing opposition in, in the U.S. to what appears to be openly redistributive policies, that you're shifting resources from one group to another. Um, but much of you know, what is the, the American welfare state um, ha, has largely been either hidden or, or unacknowledged in that resources, you know, schooling being an example, and tax dollars that African Americans were paying being shifted to, to white people, uh, tax money being shifted to certain people to support housing or zoning protections, which we don't think of as a form of sort of welfare, being applied to one area uh, to protect and increase the value while not uh, another. And I think, you know, the very idealistic part of me thinks, well, okay, if we can expose how we've had unfair redistributive policies that have been going on for, for you know, generations, um, then we can you know, make the, the logical argument that, well, it's time to reverse that. Um, uh, you know, uh, I have a now retired colleague at the University of Wisconsin, Gloria Ladson Billings, who refers to, um, she doesn't like the term achievement gap that we often use when we talk about uh, disparities in academic outcomes between uh, white students and black students. She refers to the, the educational debt and I think that sort of economic language is, is helpful, um, but then yeah, the, the sort of how, how we accomplish that politically um, is, is quite challenging. I would like to say something too. I'd like to say that I don't think, I, I haven't completely given up on the heart of people yet, you know? I think that uh, one of the reasons we write books is for people to read them and to sort of understand how we got to here, you know? And to sort of appeal to their better natures and, and uh, to understand these stories that, that have made things so difficult so that maybe they would be politically willing to do something different. Yeah. Well, I thought it was interesting and sad to hear the words I, um, I don't see this child. It's oh. interesting and sad to hear the words of uh, Lusher, you know, justifying the purpose of education. Yeah. And um, I understand maybe that there's some justification for having a school like Melka or a school like Franklin by the time kids are in high school. I mean, frankly, you know, there are kids excelling in science or arts in a way that the general school system might not be able to address. But I think that, like in terms of reparations, what can we do? It involves education, it involves health, it involves the financial system and housing. With education, I see no justification at all to have 
uh, admissions tests for young kids. There's just no excuse for it because it further, um, I think it just further segregates. The reason the kids aren't getting into the school is that they come from, you know, the background they haven't had the resources. And so we're furthering it by keeping all those kids in certain schools together. That's my one thing I think that needs to change. Yeah, really, how did that last so long? <laughs> we, got, we got one more question. My, uh, it's not a question, but just to say that uh, on the economic part, Du Bois did say uh, mid 20th century that the problem of the 20th century was Greece. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Greece. 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 Yeah, that works. Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. How about a hand for our panel? Now, I'm sure that you all have taken notice while our speakers were talking of these two gold tables in front of you with the materials that they have used throughout their research. These are out here on purpose for you all to look at and if you'd like to ask any of the scholars about them, they'll be here for you to do that, as well as Dan and Walter being available if you want to sign their books that are out in the hallway. Um, we're gonna be good here until about 10 or five to eight, and then I will start asking you to leave nicely. <laughs> and then if it gets towards eight, I'm gonna stop being nice. Uh, but, no, I'm just kidding. Thank you all very much for coming.